Good morning, and welcome to Cox Media Group Houston's Public Affairs Show, FYI. My name is uh, Susie Hanks. Uh, Arterial fibrillation, uh, hopefully I uh, said that correctly, it's commonly known as AFib, and it is one of the most common heart rhythm diseases. It affects millions of people in the U.S., but it is often misunderstood. Uh, But we are lucky enough to have today with us Dr. Percy Francisco Morales, who is also known as Dr. AFib, a Houston-based cardiologist and electrophysiologist uh, with vital heart and vein. Dr. AFib, Dr. Morales, good morning. Good morning, Susie. Thank you for having me here oh, today. Thank you so much for coming in. I um, I was noticing uh, uh, we are recording this show in September. It may not necessarily be September, but uh, September is AFib Awareness Month. And I just kind of Googled Houston and AFib, and there you were, Dr. AFib. And you have a great website and a lot of great information and great videos there. And so I wanted to bring you in and talk to you about AFib. And uh, I think a lot of people, this may be the first time they've heard about it, and other people are very familiar with it. Tell me, what is AFib? And did I say it correctly? Uh, well, the long <laughs> word is atrial fibrillation, atrial. Okay. Uh, but it's commonly, as you said, referred to as AFib. Mm-hmm. And so what is atrial fibrillation? And, and you're very correct. Many people out there just don't really know what it is. Uh, they haven't heard about it very much. And even patients who have the condition are not very familiar with what it is and what the consequences of it are. But atrial fibrillation is a very is the most common irregular heart rhythm that people have. Uh, it can make your heart beat very irregular, very fast, and very chaotic. And it dramatically increases uh, risk of stroke. I think part of the reason why people have difficulty kind of understanding it or, or it's hard to explain what it is is because it's more of an uh, electrical concept. You know, when people have heart attacks, there's a a blockage in the artery of the heart and people can kind of understand and visualize better that this is a blockage and that's what's causing the chest pain. But AFib is a purely electrical issue and it makes it a little bit harder for people to understand what it is and it's harder to educate people about atrial fibrillation. Can you feel it when when you have it? Not everybody does. Uh, There's a wide variety of symptoms that people have. Uh, There are some patients that I have, they can tell the moment that it happens. They can tell you exactly when it starts and when it stops because they feel their heart racing or their heart pounding, and they can tell immediately when when it's happening. Some patients have more subtle symptoms when they're having them. Uh, Some patients just have shortness of breath or fatigue. Uh, and it's kind of hard for them to pinpoint when they're having AFib. And then there are also several patients who are completely asymptomatic. I mean, they don't feel a thing, and they don't, they couldn't tell you if they're an AFib or not. And in these cases, the AFib gets found accidentally a lot of times. You're just there for your routine physical with your doctor, or you're getting a some other procedure done, and you're like a knee surgery, and they put you on a heart monitor, and they see that you also have atrial fibrillation. So yeah. it is found accidentally quite a bit. Um, so it's it can be found by a, a EKG or a... Uh, yes, that's the most definitive way to diagnose is with an e- EKG. Um, can it be like a fluttering or a, because when you say pounding or racing, that seems to be something very obvious, mm-hmm. but sometimes maybe you might feel a little flutter or a little kind of skipping or something like that. Yes, and like I, I was saying, that the symptoms can be very variable. Some people don't necessarily have severe symptoms, so you certainly can't have a very small or brief fluttering. And, you know, many other heart conditions can cause a fluttering. It's not just only atrial fibrillation, but it it is probably one of the most likely causes when people have fluttering. And heart monitors or EKGs can help determine if a person's fluttering is actually atrial fibrillation. Um, What are the causes of AFib? So there's a wide variety in terms of the causes or risk factors for developing atrial fibrillation. Uh, One of the strongest risk factors tends to be age. Uh, If you see a graph of the age demographics of people who have AFib, it significantly increases once people reach 70 to 80 years old. And when people reach 80 years old, that number of prevalence for AFib can be about 10%. Uh, And so age is probably one of the strongest risk factors. Uh, I describe to my patients, you know, just like people when they get older, they get wrinkles on their face, that you know, their heart kind of has some wear and tear. Uh, the technical term is called age-related fibrosis. And so you get kind of scar tissue that builds up in your heart, which can trigger AFib as people get older. 
But age, although it's a very strong risk factor, it's not the only one. Uh, other common risk factors are high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, obesity, smoking, and people who have had a past heart history. If you've had a heart attack in the past or other heart conditions like congestive heart failure, those are all risk factors for developing atrial fibrillation as well. So there's actually a, a wide list of potential risk factors. Yeah. Um, it, is it an electrical stimulation thing? Is it a, a heart muscle thing? Is, what What is it exactly that's... So I guess an easy way to explain it is it's more of an electrical stimulation which then affects your heart muscle. And so it's kind of a short circuit is how I describe it very commonly to patients. You know, there's a certain area of your heart that misfires and it triggers the rest of your heart to beat very rapidly and, and erratically. Does it um, does it cause heart attack or does it happen after heart attack? So I actually wrote made a video about this, but it's actually doesn't typically cause a heart attack, meaning that's the only reason why people have a heart attack. Um, people can certainly get chest pains from it. And sometimes when people come in the hospital because of AFib, they can have small evidence of a heart attack because their heart rate is going so fast. But if somebody's heart is otherwise normal, the strength of the heart is normal, there's no blockages in the arteries of your heart, it would be unusual for AFib to cause a heart attack. However, I, I really try to educate people that the risk factors that I just talked about, for the risk factors for AFib, they're frequently the same risk factors for having coronary artery disease, for having blockages that can cause heart attack. And so in those settings, if people have a weak heart already or they already have blockages or they've had stents done in their heart in their past, Certainly, there can be a chance that the AFib episodes would give them a heart attack. Mm -hmm. um, we are talking about AFib. We are talking to Dr. AFib, Dr. Percy Francisco Morales, who is a Houston-based cardiologist and electrophysiologist with vital heart and vein. Um, there is something, though, that AFib can really, uh, one of the big things that you look for, one of the big things that AFib can, can cause is a stroke, and that's something that people, I think, need to really be paying attention about this. This this can cause a stroke, and stroke can be debilitating for people. Tell me about that. Yes, and, and I frequently tell patients that that is the most significant part about managing AFib and treating a AFib is the risk of stroke. As a whole, patients who have atrial fibrillation have a five times increase for risk of stroke. However, it's sort of calculated individually based on an individual's risk factors, how an individual's risk of stroke is, but that is the most devastating consequence of having atrial fibrillation is the risk of stroke, and to where there's various treatment options to help reduce risk of stroke as well. And tell me why it causes stroke or how it causes stroke. And so when you're having atrial fibrillation, the upper chambers or the atria, which is where the term atrial fibrillation comes from, are beating very fast. I mean, they're basically just quivering instead of actually pumping blood effectively. And so that blood can become stagnant. And when it becomes stagnant, it can cause a blood clot. And then that blood clot can eventually go to someone's brain and cause a stroke. It just goes, I guess, downstream. Exactly. Even though it starts in your heart, it ends up going to your brain and can cause a risk of stroke. Um, is, it, is it always the cause of strokes or stroke is, strokes can be caused by other things? Uh, there's, a, there's a wide variety of things that can cause risk of stroke. Um, AFib is a very significant one, but also people can get blockages in the arteries of their neck or the arteries that are in their head. Uh, even sometimes holes in your heart can cause a stroke. So there's a variety of other reasons, but AFib is certainly a very significant reason why people get strokes. Uh, it can also lead to heart failure. Is that right? Yes, that is true. Um, as I mentioned earlier, not people always feel the heart pounding or racing or going fast. They can just feel short of breath. And so I've had patients who have had AFib undiagnosed for sometimes a period of several months, and their heart rate has been going fast for several months, 120, 140 beats per minute consistently. And that over a period of time, which can only, which in some cases may be a few weeks or sometimes even a couple of months of that, can significantly weaken a person's heart. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, it, it, the heart just gets so tired from going so fast for such a prolonged period of time. And that can certainly give somebody congestive heart failure where your main symptoms are shortness of breath or swelling in your legs and not necessarily the symptoms of AFib. Um, tell me about uh, 
when you just said somebody could be having AFib for months Mm -hmm. uh, and they don't come and see anybody. They don't raise the alarm. They don't call the doctor. Um, First of all, why do people do that? And when do you need to call the doctor? Well, probably some of the times, a lot of times these symptoms can build up subtly and gradually, you know, and when you see the patient in the hospital, you know, yes, they're very short of breath, but they'll tell you a story that it's been building up very slowly over time. And a lot of times when these um, symptoms build up slowly, it's sometimes not always a patient that notices something. It's their family or loved ones that really notice that you're not the same. You know, something is wrong. You're not able to do the things that you used to be able to do. And um, things like shortness of breath or fatigue, these symptoms that can build up subtly, can obviously be for a wide variety of reasons. But, you know, if you're noticing that you're more short of breath or your heart is racing uh, and you're just not feeling yourself, it's always important to get checked out with with your doctor. Yeah, I have a friend who had a heart attack and then uh, my uh, his girlfriend would notice that he would kind of w- withdraw a little bit mm-hmm. and rub his chest. And she asked him if, if he's okay and yes, 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 he's okay. And then she realized, no, he wasn't okay. He was telling her he was, but that was... That was the AFib coming out, and she could tell. She could tell when he was having it, but he wouldn't say anything. Yeah, frequently a lot of times it's the caregiver that has become more of an advocate because people are reluctant. You know, they don't want to go see a doctor or, you know, they don't want to have testing involved. And it's sometimes the caregivers which are more of an advocate and saying, hey, you need to get tested. You need to get yourself checked out. Yeah. When do you go see the doctor and when do you go to the ER? When is it... When is it time to make an appointment that, oh, it could wait a week or two, and when is it time to really go now? Well, the the main answer to that is symptoms. You know, if you're feeling so short of breath, you can barely walk across the room, then you should probably go to the hospital. Or if you're having severe symptoms where you're having chest pain or dizziness or feel like you're going to pass out because your heart rate is going so fast, those are times to seek urgent medical attention. Uh, other times, if you're noticing something that's been going on for a while, but you're otherwise feeling stable, you're probably stable for outpatient therapy in, in a clinic. Um, can otherwise incredibly healthy people have AFib? Yes, it's actually um, something that even healthy people can get as well. Um, there's actually a subset of marathon runners that can get AFib as well, uh, despite otherwise being extremely healthy. Uh, just very recently, there was some presentations at a cardiology conference that described that marathon runners can get some increased scar tissue in their heart and might be a reason why they get AFib. But it's certainly one of the things that even people who are healthier can get it, uh, even though the risk factors I described earlier are the most common reasons why. It, um, there are people who don't have those risk factors who end up developing AFib. And I think some of that is yet to be explained, um, why more people are getting AFib. And also, I'm seeing more patients at a younger age getting it as well. There are people in their 30s, 40s, which I probably wouldn't have seen 10 years ago, having AFib. I'm seeing more of that now. It's certainly still more common in people in their older 70s and 80s, but I'm seeing it more, and I don't think there's a good explanation as to why younger people are getting it at, at such an early age. I was going to ask you, why the increase? Is it because maybe because we're able to detect it more or or it's just actually increasing more and more people are having it? I think there's a wide variety of reasons. I think that the, being able to detect it sooner is probably a, a big chunk of that. Um, but a lot of the time, these younger patients that I'm seeing, it's because they're feeling something. It's not just accidentally being diagnosed. They're feeling their heart rates going fast. Uh, some of that may be genetics. There's certainly some genes that are been described that influence people getting AFib, but it still doesn't really explain why they're getting it at a younger age than would be expected. Um, obesity may be another reason why people are getting it at a, at a younger age. But when it comes to younger people getting AFib, I don't think there's a good explanation out there yet in terms of research and why it's happening to younger people than what would be the traditional patient age that we think of. Tell me about how stress affects this. Stress has a significant component to people's AFib. Um, the tricky part about managing stress and AFib is people like to blame it as that's why they had AFib. Um, I usually tell patients that stress doesn't cause AFib, meaning that's why you got it. But if you have AFib, 
stress can certainly make people have more symptoms. You know, when you have periods of stress, people are sleeping less. You know, sleep deprivation can certainly cause AFib. Um, just the stress itself increases stress-related hormones that can increase episodes of AFib. And sometimes when people have more stress, there may be more alcohol usage than usual, and that can also lead to episodes in AFib. So there's a lot of habits that people do when they're having more stress and anxiety, which can end up triggering more episodes of AFib. Yeah, triggering it. Yeah. I have a friend who he would have the the he would feel it and he would go to the doctor, and but the it, the doctors, I guess, weren't picking it up or weren't seeing it or anything. So he actually, he knew that if he had some red wine, it would make it happen. Mm -hmm. So he actually had some red wine sitting out in the parking lot <laughs> before he went into the emergency room because he knew mm -hmm. that that would make mm -hmm. it. And then they, and then yes, they, they detected it. Yeah. And kind of like what you're saying is when you, if you do a heart monitor or an EKG, when you're not feeling anything, it'll look completely normal. And your doctor may not be able to know what is the issue. And a hard part about diagnosing sometimes is that people might go months without getting an episode. And so if you're not having a recording or an EKG when it actually happens, it can be hard to pick up. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of options now for long-term monitoring for people who get these episodes that can be months apart. Um, there are monitors on your skin that you can wear for a long period of time. There are even small monitors that go underneath the person's skin called loop recorders, which can last for years to help pick up episodes that happen very far apart. And the technology of wearable technologies is actually increasing quite a lot lately for AFib. Um, Apple's getting into it with an Apple Watch that can do an EKG, and there's several other companies who are doing wearable technology so that people at home can, can decide, see if they're having AFib or not. Ah, your Apple Watch could pick it up. Yeah, it was actually just in Apple's uh, release, uh, their their uh, promotional event last week, that the latest, the next generation Apple Watch I will be able to do an EKG and tell you if you're an AFib. Yeah. Tell me about the effect of energy drinks on AFib because um, it's something that I saw that was kind of a, a, a shock to me. Mm -hmm. Well, um, talking about energy drinks kind of relates to caffeine usage uh. and, and AFib. And interestingly, the data behind caffeine usage and affecting AFib is kind of inconsistent. Um, you know, as a whole, I've actually met a lot of patients who, you know, when they're first told they have AFib, they like, tell them, avoid all caffeine, you know, and that, as a general rule, isn't really effective because there are some patients who can drink plenty of caffeine and it really doesn't affect their AFib at, at all, and this include coffee or, or en energy drinks. And just very recently, there was a pretty big kind of uh, review study that came out, and they basically said that there's really no clear evidence to link AFib specifically as a cause, or as coffee as a excuse me, as coffee as a trigger for atrial fibrillation, and so it kind of depends on the individual person. Um, I kind of tell people that you have to kind of be a detective about what triggers your own AFib, and there are patients who just one drink of coffee or one energy drink, and they know that they'll get an AFib, like what you said about the person you know with with the wine trigger. Mm -hmm. And there are some people who can drink one or two cups of coffee and it really doesn't affect their AFib at all. And so yeah. that's sort of why there's not really a good universal recommendation against caffeine usage for causing AFib. We're talking about AFib, atrial fibrillation. Did I say that correctly yes, this time? Right. And we're talking with Dr. AFib, Dr. Percy Francisco Morales, who is a Houston-based cardiologist and electrophysiologist with Vital Health, uh, Vital Heart and Vein. Um, so somebody goes in and they get diagnosed with it. And I think that this is something that people might be uh, afraid of. They don't want to go in because they don't want to know what's going to happen because then they have to start the treatment. How do you treat this? So there's several things that need to be discussed when somebody first gets uh, diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. And I frequently tell patients that it's, it's kind of like you have two hands. You know, there's two separate things that need to be managed, okay? The first one is your symptoms. Symptoms, reducing your heart pounding, reducing symptoms of your heart racing, reducing shorter breaths. So there's certain, there's a lot of ways to manage that. Um, at the beginning, frequently medications will be used, but there's also procedures involved which can also help reduce a patient's symptoms uh, from the atrial fibrillation. On the other hand is risk of stroke. Risk of stroke is a completely separate issue from managing atrial fibrillation, and that's kind of a separate discussion you have to have. 
uh, as I mentioned earlier, patients' risk of stroke is kind of individualized on many risk factors, which include age, whether they have high blood pressure, diabetes. And understanding an individual's risk of stroke helps to better tailor what is a proper treatment for reducing risk of stroke, which, which typically involves taking blood thinning medications. And so tell me about blood thinners. Um, I know some people on them, and I know that they can be a little scary sometimes. Tell me about that, because some people just do not want to do that. Yes, and it's, it's understandable. You know, there's many people who are very worried about taking blood thinners. Uh, they probably have heard stories of people who have had b- problems with blood thinners or have bleeding issues with, with blood thinners. Um, and I usually start off by telling patients about how much they improve risk of stroke. You know, patients frequently will ask me first, you know, can I just take an aspirin for to reduce risk of stroke? And I start off with telling them, you know, aspirin is a legitimate option for people who have a low risk of stroke. But in general, the aspirin reduces risk of stroke by about 10%. So it's better than not taking anything, but it doesn't reduce risk of stroke that much. But stronger blood thinning medications, uh, like Coumadin, that's been around for a very long time, but... Fortunately, we have a lot of newer options the last several years, which would include Xarelto or Eliquis, Pradaxa or Cerveza. We have a lot more options now, but they in general reduce risk of stroke by about 65 to 70 percent. So they're much better at reducing the risk of stroke. Yes, they're stronger blood thinners and their, their bleeding risk will be higher on these stronger blood thinners, no matter which one is the one that you take, because they are in essence stronger blood thinners, but they dramatically work better for reducing risk of stroke. Fortunately, you know, there's also other options for reducing risk of stroke, which involve procedures. Um, Tried and true method for reducing risk of stroke is blood thinning medications. But there are a lot of patients out there who have legitimate reasons why they cannot tolerate blood thinners. Like they've actually had a bleeding problem in the past, or they have risk of fallings, or they're unsteady gaits. And there's actually a lot of good procedure options nowadays to be able to reduce your risk of stroke in a minimally invasive way and not need long-term blood thinners. What are they? Uh, so there's a variety of methods. Um, there's an actually an area in the heart, which see if how can I can explain it, is it's a small pocket in the heart called the left atrial appendage. And it's kind of like a little blind pouch. And I kind of tell patients it's the equivalent of the appendix of the heart. It doesn't really contribute much to heart function, but that's where most of these blood clots form that can cause a risk of stroke. And so procedure methods to help reduce risk of stroke actually involve procedures to help get rid of that. And actually getting rid of that small little appendage area is actually uh, not a new strategy. Um, For many years now, people were having major surgery on their heart, like a bypass surgery. They would frequently sew that area, that appendage down because you don't really need it for your heart function and then it can help improve risk of stroke. But obviously that was a major uh, surgery. And uh, so nowadays we're doing the same strategy but in a more minimally invasive way. Uh, There are some surgical methods where they go through your ribs and kind of clip down the uh, appendage from the outside. But actually what's more recent, even more minimally invasive, there's catheter-based approaches where go through your groin uh, take a catheter up to, to your heart and actually deploy a plug which seals that area off. Um, it's called a watchman and it's actually been a very good procedure option for a lot of people who can't otherwise tolerate taking standard recommended blood thinners. Yeah. Um, somebody told my dad that it's like you have a pool and there's one corner of the pool that always gets the dirt in it because it's a weird design and there's this one corner and all of the grit goes in that spot. So if you take that little spot away, then... It's not not all going to collect in that spot. Yeah, and that's exactly a great way to put the point it out and for people to understand, you know, that's the area where most of these blood clots form. Yeah. So the the catheter thing, is that a catheter ablation or is that a different? No, that's different. Okay. Uh, what we, I was just talking about is Watchman, which is a plug to help reduce risk of stroke. As I mentioned before, um, managing risk of stroke is separate than managing symptoms, okay? So catheter ablation is more of a target procedure for managing symptoms. You Mm kind of go in and you try to target the areas that bring out the AFib and to help try to reduce symptoms. 
Okay. Um, we're talking about AFib. We're talking with Dr. AFib, Dr. Percy Francisco Morales, who is a Houston-based cardiologist and electrophysicist. Tell me how, when you, deter- you determine you have AFib and you're taking medication and you're getting treated, how does it change your life? Do you have to back off? Uh, can, can you still exercise? Can you still drive? Do you need to tell your family, need to wear a bracelet? What, what, does it ha- what effect does it have on your life? That's a great question. And you know, I frequently tell people when it comes to managing AFib, there's short-term plans and then there's long-term plans. You know, people, unfortunately, once you get diagnosed with AFib, even if it's dramatically improved with medications or procedures, it's still always a part of your life. And so lifestyle modifications are very important for the long-term management of, of atrial fibrillation. And that involves things such as exercise and healthy eating and trying to avoid foods that trigger AFib, um, me- avoiding smoking and alcohol because uh, those can trigger AFib. And so lifestyle modifications like exercise, dieting, and, and weight control are very important features of the long-term management of atrial fibrillation. But the goal is to have people to be functional and be able to do all the things that they did before they were diagnosed. Can you live a long, he- uh, healthy life with uh, AFib? As long as you're meeting the main criteria, which are controlling your symptoms and controlling your heart rate and protecting you from risk of stroke, you can still live a a good, healthy life. Yeah. Um, Sometimes, uh, 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 well, let's just say I have some relatives who have had um, things happen in their life and they'll forget to take the medicine and then the AFib comes up Mm -hmm. and it can really lead to something bad. You got to really stay on top of your health, don't you? That is true. That is true. And that's another reason why it's great to have advocate and family members that can help you keep on on top of these conditions. And uh, finally, we just have a minute or two, but I wanted to ask you, uh, Dr. Percy Francisco Morales, who is also known as Dr. AFib, how did you get to be Dr. AFib? How how did you make this your specialty? So I've been managing patients with AFib for over five years and have treated thousands of patients of AFib. And I noticed that there was a lack of education out there for patients. And and, you know, let me make a caveat to say, you know, there was there's a lack of a doctor's voice out there for the patient education. There's a lot of great resources for patients with atrial fibrillation. Uh, there's a lot of great reputable websites, but it's a little impersonable. They're made by big organizations who are not sitting in front of patients and knowing what they really are want to talk about and what are their real concerns. And I realize there's really not a doctor's voice out there for patient education. And about a year ago, I started Dr. AFib, and um, I was just, I tell people this story, I was rounding on the weekend in the hospital, it was 6 o'clock in the morning, you know, very busy, uh, seeing a lot of patients, and, you know, I started to think, you know, is this the only way to reach patients nowadays? You know, how can a doctor amplify his voice and educate patients beyond just seeing patients in, in the hospital? You know, at that time, I was following several blogs of travel and financial companies, and and I thought, can a doctor do this? Can a doctor do the same thing? You know, because that's not very common to see a doctor blogging about medical topics and, you know, educating the community using uh, the Internet and and social media. And so I thought, can a doctor do it? Why, Why not? You know, and this is just because not many people are doing it doesn't mean it can't be done. And so I decided that this was my desire and my passion to reach and educate more people about AFib and and not only educate but educate them as simplistic as possible. I want to explain to people as simple as I possibly can. Uh, people love being on their phones and love videos and so I create short videos of me talking about all the different things that AFib inf- influences from medications to lifestyles to treatment options and I and I put it out there on, on the internet, you know, and I've, and it's been a growing project. I gave it a catchy name, Dr. AFib, and I, it's, people are responding to it. It's growing more and more. And, uh, and if anything, it's made me more passionate about treating people with AFib because I know that it's reaching people more than I could reach just seeing people in the hospital or in, or in my clinic. Uh, I've heard of helping people in other states and other countries, you know, and, Hopefully this project will continue to grow. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. We've been talking with Dr. Percy Francisco Morales, Dr. AFib. If somebody wants to see your videos, if somebody wants to get some more information, how do they do that? How do they get a hold of you? Or how do they just see your videos? 
Well, the easiest is to go to my website, uh, easy to remember, www.drafib.com. On there, you'll see all my content and also links to several social media platforms that I'm on. I'm very active on Facebook, but I'm also on Twitter and YouTube, whatever uh, way people like to get their videos and information. And also on my website, there'll be information for how to make appointments with me uh, at Vital Heart and Bain for people who want to see me in person. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming in. I appreciate it. Uh, My name is Susie Hanks, and you have been listening to FYI.